Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you had an enjoyable lunch. We're ready to get started. Uh, I'm happy to turn the program over to Mary Ann Chapin. She'll be leading the discussion about our 2014 census test results. It's all yours, Mary Ann. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. We're starting this afternoon with a presentation on the 2014 census test results, building on what was presented in the October PMR. A significant amount of work has been done since October. There's a wealth of data available from the 2014 test that will inform our path forward. Today, we will highlight key findings. Additional analysis and results will be issued in official reports later this spring. In this session, we'll cover the following topics. Self-response and lessons learned presented by Michael Bentley results and lessons learned from administrative records removal presented by Thomas Muley, results and lessons learned from the panel comparisons and the compass instrument presented by Elizabeth Poehler, backup slides with information on the schedule of key activities for the test, the contact strategy panels, and the non-response panels are provided at the end of the slide deck for your reference. These slides have been presented in the past and will not be discussed in any detail today. Optimizing self-response and utilizing administrative records are two of the key design areas where our research is focused on the potential to achieve significant cost savings. With that in mind, the high-level objectives of the 2014 test included testing contact alternatives for both the self-response and non-response follow-up enumeration to determine the most efficient and cost-effective way to get data from non-responding households testing the use of administrative records to determine the quality of the records in conjunction with actual field enumeration while using predetermined contact strategies. Learning about the timing on how people come to the internet so that we can optimize systems and procedures for the future. Testing the enumeration instrument prototype in the field to determine its impact on completing field enumeration and to determine what are the application and operational issues that need to be addressed in future testing. And testing adaptive design approaches to set priorities for cases, to either use telephone or personal visits in specified order and to train enumerators. You will hear in this session about the 2014 census test results and how they are informing our approach to testing that will occur in 2015 and how the results are laying the foundation for design decisions that will be made later this fiscal year. As mentioned this morning, by the end of the fiscal year, we plan to reach decisions on the potential usage of administrative records in the non-response follow-up operation. Our research to date has focused on the feasibility of using administrative records for two purposes. Removal of cases from the non-response workload where administrative records indicate the address is vacant or a delete. And removal of cases from the non-response workload where we have confidence that administrative records can be used for enumeration. Our goal is to use administrative records where they work and to not use them where they do not. As you will hear in the presentation, we are beginning to gain an understanding of the feasibility of using administrative records, but need to continue our research. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mike, and he can share with you the information on self-response. Thanks, Marianne. So over the next few slides, I'm going to present findings from our data analysis specific to self-response. I'm going to cover context strategy results as you apply to optimizing self-response, non-ID processing, and questionnaire content, mentioning lesson learned and next steps for each. First, I just want to briefly summarize what we tested for ways to optimize self-response. The first objective of the research was to test the implementation of a notify me census. 
This is where we send a sample of addresses a postcard inviting them to sign up to be notified by email or text when it's time to respond to the survey. In an actual census, the idea is that this would be part of the initial advertising and promotional blitz where eager respondents could engage with us and we could reduce paper mailings. The second objective was to test the use of internet response without an ID. Here, we did not provide the sample panel without, with a user ID to enter the internet site. The goal for this was to test our ability to process and match respondent provided addresses. This was accomplished daily in batch. For the spring 2015 census test, we're working on real-time matching functionality while the respondent is in the survey. The third objective was to test the use of email as an in initial invitation to respond in lieu of mail materials. Finally, we also tested a couple tweaks to our standard internet push design. It should be noted that because the 2014 census test was a site test and not a nationally representative sample, no broad generalizable conclusions should be drawn about the results. So our major findings as they pertain to optimizing self-response include, first and foremost, that internet push where we did not send a paper questionnaire right away is a successful strategy for generating internet responses. Altogether, out of the entire universe for the 2014 census test of approximately 192,000 cases, 50.6% responded by internet. With a total response rate of 66%, that means that out of all self-responses, including internet, paper, and phone responses, more than three quarters, 76.8% responded online, which is great, and we were very happy with that result. The next finding was that respondent participation in Notify Me was low. Of 10,000 cases invited to do so, only 3% participated. We also found that per, perhaps not surprisingly, email was not an effective replacement for postal mail. Over half of the emails that we sent bounced back to us and total response rates for these panels were 10 percentage points lower than the control panel. In addition, automated, automated voice invitations to landline phones showed no impact on response when used as a, either a pre-notice or as a reminder. Based on these experiences and analysis, we are applying the following lesson learned and next steps to 2015 testing. First, it does appear that a standard mail internet push invitation approach is the contact method that is currently performing the highest, which is consistent with other surveys that we conduct as well as other academic survey research. And we're gonna test tweaks to this as a baseline moving forward. In the 2015 national content test, which you will learn a lot more about later this afternoon, we are experimenting with a variety of different approaches to maximize response rates, including altering the timing, order, format, and number of contacts. Second, we also learned that email invitations or reminders are currently not an effective replacement for postal mail. Though we do still see some potential value here, and in the 2015 national test, one of the panel designs will include using email as a reminder delivered at about the same time as paper reminders, just not replacing them. Third, to succeed, Notify Me needs advertising and promotion to educate respondents about this option. And we'll, we'll learn more about some of these unique advertising efforts this afternoon from Steve Buckner during the 2015 testing session. Next, I'm gonna provide some of the final res results related to non-ID internet responses, where respondents could access the survey site without a unique ID. This test provided the opportunity to test enhancements to our existing non-ID processing. And here's what we found. First, the response rates were lower compared to the control panel, which contained a user ID. For internet responses, the difference was more than five percentage points. 46.3 for the control panel compared to 40.6% for the panel without an ID. Response was also lower overall, 58.9% for the non-ID panel and 61.4% for the control panel with ID. One explanation for the difference is that the address provided for all non-ID responses needs to be matched to our frame. If a respondent provided address is not matched, then effectively it's a non-response for our purposes. Results from the matching operation, though, did show that about 5% of non-ID responses were not matched, though this was a much higher match rate than we saw in 2010 for non-ID responses. In addition, the use of address supplementation from administrative records isn't needed very often, but when it is used, it increases matching rates by about 50%. Based on these results and analysis, we believe that a non-ID response option could have great value in the presence of a census promotional campaign. This will be studied as part of the spring OSR test in the Savannah media market, 
which again, you're going to hear more about this afternoon. Also, we learned that the su success of allowing non-ID responses depends on accurate matching. The spring test will include real-time non-ID processing as a means of increasing these match rates. And lastly, we need to test non-ID processing on a more diverse set of addresses, such as more rural route addresses, for example. We hope that the advertising and outreach in the OSR test will generate more of these non-sample addresses for more robust testing. Next, I'm going to move on to some of the main findings from the questionnaire content testing that was included in the 2014 site test. As you may be aware, one of the findings from the Census 2010 alternative questionnaire experiment was that a combined race and Hispanic origin question was found to be a more accurate and truer ref reflection of respondents' racial identities than a separate question. The AQE was a paper only, though, so this was the first time that we tested this comparison on the Internet. We found that the use of the combined question compared to separate questions showed no difference in the distribution for most groups. Further, soliciting race right in race and origin details online on a separate screen from the major group checkboxes compared to on the same screen results in more detailed reporting. So what does that mean? For example, if a, re a respondent was more likely to say that they were Cuban, for example, than just simply saying that they were Hispanic or Latino, we would count Cuban as a detailed response for that group. Detailed reporting for the major groups varied a, quite a bit by question version. The combined question saw higher percentages for white, black, and Hispanic, but a little lower for Asian and Native Hawaiian. Finally, we also tested the use of a new relationship question, which includes categories to distinguish same-sex and opposite-sex categories for s spouse and partner relationships. This showed no difference in distributions for each category, though the paper form did see slightly higher item non-response for the new version. I do want to reiterate once again that this was a site test and not focused on evaluating content as a main objective. The 2015 National Content Test will continue testing race and Hispanic origin, relationship, and other content on a larger nationally representative sample. Among, among other things, this will include testing different approaches to optimize detailed race and origin reporting online. And findings from the relationship question need to be validated with a national sample. Next, Tom is going to provide some results on the use of administrative records in the 2014 test. Thank you, Mike. So we're going to, I'm going to briefly do for the 2014 census test, give a brief summary of the test design. Uh, I'm going to give some results and lesson learned from the administrative records and our comparisons that we ended up doing. And Eli is going to give some results of the internet interview panel comparisons and also looking at the evaluations of the compass instrument. So just a brief summary of the 2014 NERFU uh, census test design. Just a reminder, this results were presented at the previous PMR, is that the initial NERFU workload that was established on July 29th, this test had a census day of July 1st. So on July 29th, we had determined a NERFU workload of 46,247 addresses. And also just a reminder that all non-responding addresses in the area were included. We didn't have to do any subsampling. Our, just a reminder, our non-response follow-up operation was conducted between August 14th and September 25th. So this is a brief summary of the four panels that we used in the 2014 census test. There was the control panel where we ended up implementing 2010-like procedures, but we did have the automa automation of the compass instrument and the automated control system. We did have two panels which ended up using our reduced contact strategy. In those, we ended up having personal visits uh, with, with a telephone option in the middle. And these two panels differed because we ended up having whether administrative records were used or not. The second panel listed, no administrative record cases were used to remove any of the workload for that panel. In the third panel, we did end up implementing our full administrative record removal. In the course of our processing, we were able to identify cases that we determined either be occupied and we had a household population that we could insert or those that we could determine to be vacant based on their administrative records. For this test, we did not identify any deletes or th those units that we thought were non-existent. So of those two, if we identified any of those two groups of cases, they were initially, they were removed from the workload right away. 
Our fourth panel was our adaptive design panel. This one did have a caddy component where it had outbound calling of some cases. It also ended up having, when the field work was occurring, we did assign seven priority cases to the interviewer to be completing each day. That was something that ended up changing daily. And areas either got one or three total visits based on their geographic location and their 2010 response rates. It did have an administrative records component. And this is what we refer to as our hybrid component. It did have the same treatment that we had for vacants. If we identified a unit as being vacant based on its administrative records, it was removed before the field work even happened. For those cases that we identified as being administrative record occupied with a household composition, we proceeded to allow those units to receive one visit out in the field. In the course of doing that, they got one visit. In the course of doing that, either they could go online and self-respond on the internet, they could decide to take their paper questionnaire and send it back, or we could have a completion with the enumerator at the doorstep. That was three potential ways of us to be able to resolve the case. If we didn't get one of those, we did not go back again. They only received one visit. And also just a reminder of the administrative record sources that we ended up using for our production. So we did end up using the United States Postal Service. They're undeliverable as addressed. We mailed a, a, a pre-notice on, on June 23rd. So we were able to use the information that the United States Postal said about whether they were able to uh, deliver it and the reasons that were collected between June 23rd and July 6th. So the primary, we ended up using vacant, which is a reason that we did use in the 2013 test. We also included additional reasons to be able to include to test those out. And the main one that we contributed in this time was unable to forward. So we're doing that as a difference from 2013. For the person information we ended up utilizing, we took information from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Statistics from their Medicare transaction database. We ended up using two years of that information. Uh, since we got the deliveries in the August timeframe and our test was a July, we ended up looking at two years of the past data and said, did we see consistent households in a two year period? We also were able to receive from the Internal Revenue Service tax year 2013 information that was delivered to us in early July, and we ended up processing that and using the returns through the first half of the year. Uh, and we're also able to use information from the Social Security uh, Numident database. So now we're going to look at some of the results overall by the panels and by the, by the four panels that we end up having. So we're going to take a step back and we're going to focus on all the entire cases. So we're looking at all of the 112,000 cases that we ended up having going out for the field work. So the left one is the control panel. So in that one there at the bottom, we ended up having 59% uh, of the cases there ended up where we were had a self response before our nerf food cut was done. We proceeded to go out and do our non response follow up operation and we were able to resolve 32% of those in the next bar up above that. With resolution in this one, we were able to determine the status, whether it was occupied, vacant, or delete. And also, if we determined it was occupied, we were able to determine the population count in there. So there was a, a, a total of 9% that was unresolved for that panel. For the reduced contacts without administrative records, it had similar comparisons as the, uh, the, the control panel. 60% uh, of those were completed before the NERFU cut. Another 29% of the whole entire universe was completed during NERFU with 10% unresolved. Uh, my focus for the main part of this will be on the administrative record uh, panels that had those removals. So for the one, the panel that had the re reduced contacts with the full removal, there we ended up having 58% before the cut. And then we ended up having 2% in the next bar where based on our administrative records, we were able to identify them as being vacant. Uh, then we end up in the purple, we ended up having 24%. So based on our administrative records processing, we were able to identify those as being administrative records occupied, and we had a household to insert there. For the remaining 16% of the uni entire universe, they went out for field work, 10% were resolved, 6% were unresolved. And then the last the panel, which ended up having our hybrid removal, again, we had a 58% before the contact, uh, before the uh, non-response follow-up cut. Another 2% which was done by the uh, determined based on the administrative records vacant. 
And then with the next two blocks, we had a series of both of them showing 12%. The first one, the green 12%, is those were the cases where we had administrative records information, but we did receive the enumeration from the person. Either they ended up going online, they ended up sending in their paper questionnaire, or they will complete the enumeration on the doorstep. So for those 12%, we were able to receive data from the household. The, the net remaining 12%, uh, above there, we did not receive any NERFU information, so we ended up utilizing our administrative records for those cases. For the remaining about 17%, which went out, 12% uh, were resolved and 5% were unresolved. If any of these columns do not add up to 101, that's just a rounding error. So with the, let's look a little bit further at the administrative records with our vacant removal. In these two panels, we identified there were about 2% of the whole entire uh, universe that we were determined to be vacant. So one of the things we were able to take advantage of in, in this analysis is the left panel, the control panel. There was no administrative records that were removed there, but we were still able to do our administrative record processing on those cases there. So we can compare our processing and our results to cases which ended up getting field work. So it shows some results of those later. There's a couple of comments about the 2% that was a little bit lower than we were initially were expecting. One of the things that we did end up seeing in this test is we had fewer undeliverable as addresses in this 2014 test time period as we did in 2010. So at least with, we were seeing fewer UAA reasons and since UAA reasons are a main uh, driver of determining units to be vacant, we ended up identifying a, a smaller number in this test. But let's look a little bit at these 2% and see what ended up happening with those particular cases. So in the control panel with our processing, we were able to identify 464 cases that we determined to be vacant based on our administrative records processing. Looking at the results in the control panel, 366 of them were able to resolve the status in NERFU. So looking at those 366 status cases, 194 were determined to be vacant, 62 were determined non-existent, and 110 were occupied. So we had 53% vacant, 17% non-existent, 30% occupied. So we end up having 53% where we end up matching the same status. We had another 17% where we did not match the same status, but both of those are being classified as unoccupied. And then we end up, did end up seeing in this test, we had 30% that were determined to be occupied. So this is definitely one area where we wanted to do some more investigation. So what we ended up doing was looking at further at these 110 cases in the control panel. What was going on with these cases that we ended up seeing? So we ended up doing some further looking, we ended up seeing. So uh, we already have 51 cases which ended up having a series of things which we ended up noticing. Six of these cases, when we ended up looking at the notes fields of the NERFU interview coming out of Compass, they have some type of note indicating the unit might be vacant. We kept looking further and we ended up identifying eight cases where the notes was indicating there was some movement that, that they thought was going around at that, that unit around July 1st. We ended up seeing another instance where there was another four field notes indicating it might be a possible delete, a non-existent housing unit. Kept going through, there was 11 interviews where the results of the interview could determine the status that it was occupied, but the, the interview was not totally complete and didn't determine a population count. We did end up having 14, which we ended up looking, that they were resolved by the self-response option. So either, either through the internet or TQA, at least one thing with this particular test is that in that particular option, there's not a question dedicated for vacants to be determined that the, the self-response that the unit is vacant. Now, in the last one, we did also end up noting there was about eight, eight of the addresses after this particular point where there still was some building access issues. We also did look at the national change of address file. And for 110 of these units, I look at the 110 units, there was 23 where we are seeing based on change of address, there was some in filing of that for these particular units within two months of census day. So, so we also, we decided that this, we also looked at the administrative records occupied removal. So looking back overall, we were able to identify 24% of the whole entire universe in the full removal panel and the 12% in the hybrid removal panel. So we wanted to end up looking at how the status and the account comparison for those cases. So again, we went back to our control panel. We were able to identify 7,028 administrative records, occupied addresses. We proceeded to look through and, the, and there was 6,259 where the NERFU result and the census processing had the status being resolved. We proceeded to go further and end up for the, there was 5,883 
or 94% where the census NERFU result was determined was occupied. So we're agreeing on occupied status 94% of the time. We proceed to look further and be able to identify the cases where the NERFU status was determined to be occupied, but also there's a population count. So that last box of 5,442, we have cases where we have census responses with a population count. We have our administrative records in our population count. So we're gonna do some, we did some additional analysis looking at those. So looking at those 5,442 cases, we did a comparison of what was the, did the census count, did the census count match our administrative records count? And our finding with looking to the control panel was that the overall match rate was 54%. We did end up seeing that there was 13% where administrative records had one fewer person and also 16% where administrative records had greater than one person. So that was 83% where there's plus or minus one. We did see instances where there was 10% where ADREC had two or more people and 7% where ADREC had two or fewer people. So we did, wanna, we did look further to be able to see, try to explain, especially this 54% overall. Was this varying by different types of household structures? So we were able to take our administrative records, the households that we were able to compute and put together, we were able to then take from the Social Security Newman and database, we were able to get the ages. So we could make household composition categories. We could classify them based on the number of adults, based on being 18 or older, and whether children are present or not. So they will make these seven categories listed here. So when we end up looking at the comparisons of the administrative records uh, based on these categories, we ended up seeing some differences. We ended up seeing higher count agreements for if there was one adult and no children present, or if there was two adults with no children present, or two adults with one or one with one or more children present. Those three household compositions had match rates of 57, 61, and 65%. We did end up noticing that if we have instances of one adult and one plus children, or instances where we had three or more adults or the other category, those results were between 32 and 40%. So we're definitely seeing differences in our household matches based on these administrative record compositions that we were able to put together. So with some of the lessons learned and things we're doing forward is with administrative records vacant. We are looking at these results and seeing what improvements we are being able to make. We did use the vacant code and also the do not forward code. So we're deciding which codes to be using as we're going forward in our production rules and continue. We're also configuring and taking into account our business rules and our models to address what's the desired tolerance of the difference between administrative record vacant determination and the NERFU occupied differences that I was showing earlier. For administrative records occupied, we were able to utilize, see if we might be able going forward, utilize more of this household composition in our rule-based and our model-based assignments. So we definitely are doing that and we are continuing to examine this data a little bit, continuing further, especially to be able to see categories understand, especially the one adult with children present. And now I'll transition over to Eli. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna look at the impact of the various contact strategies and the use of administrative records on the NERFU interviews themselves. So again, you've seen this slide before, Tom just presented it. Um, we're gonna focus on the NERFU interviews. So in the control panel, we're mostly talking about that 32% where the data comes from NERFU interviews themselves as the, and the 9% that are unresolved. In the reduced contact strategy, without the use of administrative records, we're focused on the 29% of the cases with NERFU interviews and the 10% that are unresolved. In the reduced contact strategy with the full admin rec removal, we're focused on the 10% of cases with the NERFU interviews and the 6% unresolved. And finally, in the adaptive design with the hybrid ad rec removal, we're focused on the 12% of NERFU interviews without ad rec, the 12% of cases with NERFU interviews where we did have ad rec, but we were able to complete an interview after the one visit, as well as the 5% unre unresolved. So the first thing we looked at was the average number of contact attempts. And looking at the table, um, we see that the strategies which reduce the maximum number of contacts allowed have overall lower averages, as you would expect. 
However, what we also noted here is that the control panel average is higher than we anticipated when compared to the 2010 census. The average contact attempts in Washington, D.C. in the 2010 census was 2.7, and in Montgomery County it was 2.6. That is for the entire county, not just for the subsection that was in the control panel, but we think that comparison is comparable. So we'll need to continue to monitor this moving forward to understand more about why, um, what would cause the number of attempts to be higher and if those attempts would relate to other contact strategies. Next we looked at the completion rate or the completed interviews. These completion rates include CAPI and CADI completed interviews, self-response received after after the NERFU universe was established, as well as cases that we used administrative records for. And you can see here that the use of administrative records leads to higher completion rates. Next, looking at proxy rates. Comparing the control panel to the reduced contact strategy without the use of administrative records, we see no impact on the proxy rate. So a reduction in the number of attempts does not appear to impact the proxy rate. But using administrative records to remove occupied cases in the reduced contact strategy with, with the full ad rec removal increases the proxy rate. And by not allowing proxies in the portion of the adaptive design panel, we say that the proxy rate is reduced. Okay, and then next we looked at the housing unit status distribution. Here we see that the unresolved rate for housing unit status is high. It is primarily being driven by non-interviews, which were higher in the 2014 census test than the 2010 census. The use of administrative records reduces the unresolved housing unit status rate, and the vacancy rates are not significantly different between the panels. We would we plan to continue to research the non-interview and unresolved rates and to monitor this, monitor this in the 2015 test. Okay, so next we explored the CADI interviews. CADI interviews were conducted just for the adaptive design panel for the first two weeks of the operation. 8,859 cases had phone numbers and were eligible to be interviewed as part of CADI. We see that 5.2% of those cases were completed in CADI, and just under 25% actually had a late self response. So no further interviewing on those two categories of cases were needed. However, the remainder of the categories that are shown on the slide required further interviewing in the field or with CAPI. 6.7% ended up being refusals, 3.4% were partial interviews, 0.3% were language barriers, and just under 16, 60% we had no contact with anyone. Among those 8,859 cases we sent to CADI, there were 21,416 phone numbers. That is, there was more than one phone number provided for most of the cases. So looking at the phone numbers in particular, we found that 2.2% yielded completed interviews, 5.9% resulted in a non-interview, 10.5% were determined to be bad numbers, 46.5% were attempted but no contact with anyone was made so we're unable to determine if the phone number was a good number or not, and 34.9% of the phone numbers were never tried. This could be because the first number we used for the case was successful or we received a late return. So there was no reason to continue to dial numbers for that case, for example. So our, our lesson learned at this point based on the results of the 2014 test and some of the similar results we saw in the 2013 test is that we need more effective phone numbers and or improved or changed interviewing methods in order for CADI to be an effective interviewing method. Another aspect of the CAPI operation in the 2014 census test was in, to encourage self-response during NERFU interviewing. When a respondent was not home when an enumerator visited, the enumerator left a notice of visit telling a respondent that they were there and instructing the respondent to go online or call the telephone questionnaire assistance hotline to complete a census form. The idea behind this is that we could avoid a return visit to the housing unit if the respondent completed the form. 
So what we saw was that 4,385 self-responses were received after we started the NORFU operation on August 14th. 3,974 of those occurred after at least one attempt by an enumerator. 31% were received, the self-responses were received the same day as the NORFU attempt, and 62.9% were received within two days of that NORFU attempt by the enumerator. Of the cases that were received after the start of NERFU, 61.1% responded via the internet, 15.7% via the telephone questionnaire assistance, and 23.2% via paper. Based on this experience, we believe that this push to self response during NERFU is a successful approach. We need to assess the optimal wait time between visits to allow for the self-response and research ways to identify potential self-responders during NERFU to optimize this, this approach. Okay, and finally, we looked at some debriefing and observations um, of the Compass interview and of interviewing in general and found a couple of areas that I wanted to highlight. We talked about the first one at the September uh, PMR. Um, we did identify some issues with block buildings and multi-units in this test. Interviewers, we found that interviewers were recording attempts for a unit or sometimes all the units in a multi-unit building, even when they couldn't reach it. So if the outdoor door was locked and they couldn't get to the unit, they were just positioning the cases for the units in that building. There were also observations that, that there were interviewers trying to gain access or contact the same building manager. Um, multiple of them at the same time. So we'll talk in a minute about what, what we're going to look at in terms of addressing this. Another issue that we identified was with vacant and deleted units. Um, multiple attempts were required before attempting a proxy in the 2014 test. And this was due to the contact rules that we had in place. So they were required to make three contacts, for example, with the housing unit before going to a proxy. This isn't necessarily not necessary for vacant and deleted units. And finally, for telephone attempts made by enumerators um, out in the field, so not caddy interviews. If multiple phone numbers were available, interviewers were dispositioning the case after dialing one number versus all of the numbers if the first number wasn't successful. Also, interviewers noti noted that moving between the Compass application and the phone application on their device was not smooth and sometimes required them to write down the numbers in order to make the correct phone call. So some of the lessons learned from these observations. Um, based on the observations about the multi-unit and lock building issues, um, a group of headquarters staff got together in October to work through this issue, and we determined that we do need to conduct more training on multi-units and access issues for the enumerators. We want to clarify to interviewers that attempts should only be recorded when a housing unit is reached. So if the building is locked, they're not to record that as an attempt at the housing unit but they are to notify their supervisor immediately if they encounter that situation. For vacant and deleted units, we're recommending creating options in the Compass interview, Compass application to allow interviewers to disposition cases prior to making attempts, at all, of, all of the attempts in some cases. So for example, we would have an option in the Compass interview for the interviewer to note, I think this unit might be vacant. And then the Compass interview would prompt them to go visit a proxy immediately. If that proxy confirmed that indeed the unit is vacant, the case is resolved and no additional attempts are made. If the proxy would indicate, no, I think somebody is living there, then the in interviewer would continue to make attempts at that housing unit before attempting another proxy interview. And in general, we will continue to make imp improvements to the Compass instrument to address additional special situations. We'll now take any questions that you have. Trish. Uh, where did the telephone numbers come from for both the caddy and the cappy? Yep, so the telephone numbers that were utilized in this test were provided by our internal center for CARA, the Center for Adaptive 
Center for Administrative Records Research, um, and they procured them from outside sources. So that was the same as what was used by the non-ID processing the same area? I see it. The same application or the same repository? Yeah, the, sorry. Is Dave here? Again? Okay. Okay. This is Dave Shepard from CARA. Uh, yes, both of those tasks, putting that database of phone numbers and emails together, as well as uh, working with the non-ID people to use administrative records to supplement um, our ability to uh, math match those, both came from our area. Thanks. So the administrative records that were used for NERFU in, in the analysis that you did, Tom, that was a separate area. That was a separate repository, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I know you're getting, uh, I ask this question sometimes when I see you in interviews, but um, I guess my, my confusion and I'm tr really trying to clear up is, um, did the 14 test, how, did it get us, did, did it get census closer to that predictive ability and, you know, some kind of measured level of accuracy to predict which of these houses are going to match? It helped us out because we're especially with the household composition work that I was showed. It did allow us to identify a certain composition, which we are seeing better performance than others. So we were able to see that in the 2014 test. But one of the one of the things is similar to what Mike Bentley mentioned, this is a site test. So there is limitations of this particular area. And the other at least challenge for the administrative records is that census day was July 1st. So in, in 2020, census day is gonna be on July, on April 1st. So this comparison of administrative records, especially IRS returns between February and April, it's a, it's a the, one of the caveats is it is a further away time period to put some of the comparisons. What will be the ideal test or testing that will uh, accomplish the, the uh, gap? And the, and the nice thing with the planning for the 2015 census test, it has an April 1st census day. So that was one of the nice thing about the test that we're gonna be doing coming up is that it is on the April 1st time frame. So you'll be predicting which houses you don't have to go to beforehand and then checking the accuracy of the results. Hey, Michael, um, regarding the non-ID um, responses and the address matching, how exact did the uh, respondent have to enter their address um, for it to be deemed a match or unmatchable? For instance, if they put unit instead of apartment or spelled out street instead of ST, was that something that would have triggered as a non-match or? I'm gonna ask uh, Frank McPhillips, who, okay. who actually did some of that work to come up, but he can give you a much better answer than I can. Okay. Here, here, you, that's why this one works. the director <laughs> I was I was trying to avoid that but uh, no. um, it's a simple answer uh, we didn't just do exact matching geography division has a complex set of um, you know, a variety of, of matching techniques so um, there was um, equivocation as well so not all elements had to be exactly the same Dan Cork, National Academies. Uh, just to follow up on the uh, non-ID um, a little bit, on the response rate, the response dip in the non-ID, um, was there anything different in, any difference in the wording, in the appearance um, of the materials that they would have seen or whatnot, that the absence of um, 
an identifier or even reference to an identifier might look less legitimate, um, more you know, stock mail. Yeah, the difference in the materials, the materials between the control panel that had the ID and the non-ID panel that did not have an ID, they were very similar except for the absence of that ID and um, theoretically the, the sample cases that were in the non-ID panel should, would not have even known that there would be an ID. But um, I think on the, yeah. on the, on the it, one panel would have said you need this user ID to log in but on the non-ID case, it wouldn't say yeah, so the opposite of that. that. It wouldn't say so you don't need any sort of identifier to log in. Yeah, the non-ID panel was taken to a, a different um, login page w mm -hmm. where they were first asked to just provide an email address and then uh, pass a CAPTCHA to get in, whereas the ID panel were taken to a different page that first asked for their unique uh, ID number. Okay. But um, so, yeah, so the difference, the non-match rate accounts for some of that difference. The rest of that difference, we're not really sure. It could be something having to do with legitimacy or what. We, we don't have a, okay. we, we need to learn more about that. And not at all defending automated voice invitations. I'm not going there, but uh, since you mentioned the, the use of them and to talk about the, uh, there being no real impact on response, what does that mean exactly? Is that response overall over the lifetime of the test? Is it looking within a time window of uh, when the machine, uh, you, when the phone message would have arrived? Um, any sort of signal, a, a spark of anyone at all being reminded by um, right. the so, phone notice? So to provide a little bit more details, we, we tested this in, in two different panels. One was as a pre-notice, and this was actually as a pre-notice for one of the email invite panels. So um, we had a panel where we send calls, say the test is coming, P please respond when you receive materials, and then they got an email, and then we compared that to the panel that just got an email right off the bat, and there was no measurable, we couldn't see anything in terms of any um, impact on response there. The uh, other panel was where um, we send it after they received the paper questionnaire, and um, in terms of the response rates, we, we just not seeing any anything there. Um, Dave Shepard, and who spoke a little while ago in his contact frame team, is, is trying to dig into those results a little bit more, kind of the paradata from, you know, what, when we send the, uh, when we leave a message, you know, did, did we get an answering machine? Did somebody pick up the phone? Did, is there some indication that it's a working number? And they're trying to do a little bit more there to figure out the overall impact of it. But on the overall top line numbers, it's, it's eventual response right, at it's all? pretty okay. much flat. Um, Eli had results about the 31.1% um, of responses received the same day as the NERFU attempt, 62.9 um, within two days, the biggest take up by internet. Is there any sort of metadata that might be attached to those records that might be able to um, parse out how much of that was responding to the notice of visit? Um, I, I guess, that, I mean, the paper responses would would have to be late mail returns just coming in in the stream, but the other, the phone responses or the uh, internet responses could be just some people responding to the thing on their door as opposed to um, finally getting around to sending in the form. Yeah, so unfortunately there is not any additional data to tell us that they were going online because they have this notice of visit in their hand versus they just happened to remember or they found their form sitting at home. Um, so we're, we're really just using, you know, we're really just using the date time frame to say that something perhaps about this NERFU visit now has prompted them to pick up the paper form that's been sitting on the desk or, or call us or go online. And then on the tech front, you mentioned um, the enumerator sometimes having to write down numbers to call the handoff between Compass and the phone application, is that a limitation of Compass or a limitation of the iPhone? Uh, just the um, not being able to use data connections at the same time as the phone to begin with, was there a, a link out to the phone app that was supposed to work that didn't work? Um, yeah, so um, both, both applications can work at the same time, and in fact they have to in order to make a call on the iPhone and complete the interview. So 
that was the case, then they were doing that. But there was not a link to say, like, say, I want to call this number that's on my screen, and I would select it, and it would dial. They had to manually go over to the phone application on the device and then manually enter the number. That was as designed. That's what we did. Um, I don't know that there is or is not a technical limitation. It was just in terms of progressing and, and starting the Compass application is not something we had asked them to do for the test. Okay, so it was just a, a function that wasn't initially Correct, envisioned. it was not a requirement okay. for them to implement. Um, a final point of trivia, when you mentioned the um, enumerator is supposed to notify their, or looking ahead, notify their supervisor immediately if they detect a locked building. What is the supervisor supposed to do? So for the 2015 test, um, that supervisor or their up the line supervisor is being asked to research ways to maybe have a centralized approach to contacting the building management instead of all of these individual interviewers doing it or find out if there's other resources to gain access. Moving beyond the 2015 test, um, there are some thoughts about perhaps working with some property management associations to, to build or maintain a database of people to identify these types of units and, or have contacts so that we have them in advance and we're prepared for these situations. Um, so we're kind of And that was, that was the that. question, whether it touches off an intervention or a, uh, someone else trying to broker access from a higher level to get into the building as opposed to just, this is why I can't do the work right, right. now. Okay. Right. Dan, I actually witnessed this in the field when I went out for non-response follow-up in Northwest, Northwest DC. We could not gain access to the building. The enumerator did call the supervisor and she said, we've had problems with that building before. Here's the management company's phone number. We did call the management company, but at that point we couldn't get through. Ended up getting in the building a different way, but it was evidence that if you do call, you know, the supervisor, sometimes they have this additional information. Hi, Ty Mitchell, Government Accountability Office. Thanks for all this information. This is trying to keep up with all the, the results. It sounds like you've got a lot to, to think about. Uh, uh, in the weeds question, and then kind of more of a high level one, in the weeds on, on slide 13, this is, I think, real simple. We're looking at this 40.2% CAPI proxy rate. Um, is that in the reduced contact strategy with full administrative records removal? And, and you already draw the conclusion that by removing those, the proxy rate goes up. Is that simply a, a data point that admin records in this case is kind of getting some of the low-hanging fruit or some of the easier cases? Is that, I mean, is that really what's going on? Is there something else that I'm missing? We're still looking for it. Okay. So, Ty, can you tell us what slide you're yeah, looking I'm sorry, at slide, again? Slide 30? 30. Thank I'm you. Sorry. The CAPI proxy rate table? Sorry. I thought it started with three. There was sorry. Peter 13. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. So you're, you're referring to the adaptive design panel? The 40.2%. Oh, the reduced contacting strategy? Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you already draw the conclusion that, with the observation, that using AR to remove increases the proxy rate. I'm just curious, is that, is, that, is, that, is that what we're seeing? The administrative records kind of took care of some of the easy cases and what's left behind? I mean, or do you have some other thoughts on... I mean, that was, that was kind of my thought, yeah, is that the removing the ad rec removes so the easier cases and so the remaining ones are the harder cases and require more work or require okay. those proxy. No, I, I didn't want to overanalyze it. I just, I think it's a, it's a great data point in the, the conversations about, you know, you might do some things that reduces, takes care of the easy ones. It doesn't necessarily mean the nerf, the nerf on those cases is going to get any cheaper, but you're removing some, you're reducing the overall expense by taking some things offline. And, but it's just in, that that's an artifact, I think, of, of, of that. I just, just verifying that. Thanks. Thanks for the weeds. The, the higher level one, there's a lot of uh, additional pieces of research that are alluded to in your presentation, and there's probably many others that you didn't explicitly mention. And uh, how... Can you say just a few sentences about the mechanism that's going to ensure that uh, the ones that need follow-up are going to get the research, where those are going to get done, some of these might get handed off to other teams, and just kind of tracking a lot of the knowledge and the leads you've got. You probably can't afford to do all of them, but you know, how, kind of just talk us through the, the mechanism for making sure that that's a kind of concerted effort. And, yeah. um, 
I'll start, and I would like to start off by commending the people at this table and their teams back in the office because these results um, are, you know, the preliminary pieces of the assessment. The final assessments are not yet complete. With that said, we're already taking these findings and applying them to our planning for the 2015 tests. Um, compared to the 2010 census, I'm really starting to recognize the benefit of doing these more frequent tests and applying the lessons learned. Um, it, it is making a difference. Uh, we do have the experts at the table. Uh, we are ensuring that we're applying the lessons learned to the next round. Um, even thinking forward to 16, uh, we're saying, well, remember what happened in 13, what happened in 14, making sure that we're applying the findings. Any other questions? We're right on track today. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move to our next presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now we'll move into the 2015 testing plans. Uh, Jill, are you at the? Jill is at the table, way down there. <laughs> um, Jill's going to kick it off with an overview of our plans for 2015. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this nice cold afternoon in January. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the high level testing objectives for 2015. And following my update, um, Evan will talk with you in more, in de more in depth about the address validation test, which is currently underway, followed by Marianne Chapin, who will cover the 2015 census test. Stephen Buckner is going to address the um, optimizing self response test. And Jennifer Kim will finalize this session with a discussion on the 2015 national content test. I know you saw this slide back in the fall, um, but many people um, weren't part of that, uh, were not um, part of that update. So I just wanted to cover the high level um, testing objectives again. For the purpose of the 2015 census um, test, objectives are to focus on the major design decisions and content development for the 2020 census. We will inform the performance of the methods and models that will help us develop the address list, test of the use of aerial imagery for change detection, and assist in the delineation of the re-engineered address canvassing workloads. We will also test the feasibility of fully utilizing the advantages of planned automation and available real-time data to transform the efficiency and effectiveness of data collection operations. And we are also looking to re-engineer the roles, responsibilities, and infrastructure in the field. Shown on the screen is the graphic that I presented in the October PMR. As indicated earlier this morning, we do have four testing activities planned for 2015. The address validation test began in September on the second phase is currently underway. The 2015 census test has an April 1st census day in Maricopa, and that um, is on its way to, we're developing that as we go right now. The optimizing self-response test also has an April 1st census day, and the national content test is um, scheduled for a September 1st census day. The address validation test summary. We will look to inform the performance of the methods and models that will help us develop the address list. We will test the use of aerial imagery for change in detection and implementation of partial block canvassing as an alternate for full block canvassing and assist in the delineation of the re-engineered can canvassing workloads. The first part of the test was called the math model validation test. All of our field operations for this phase of the test ended on December 15th. We listed 10,100 blocks, and we checked 821 blocks during our listing check. The partial block canvassing portion of the test began, I'm sorry, we received OMB clearance on October 29th, and the field, option, uh, field operations, our lister started field work on the week of December 15th, and the, the uh, operations are scheduled to end next week on the 16th. I had the pleasure um, to be part of this test. I actually just returned Wednesday night. I spent three days in South Florida, and I traveled 650 miles and went to 25 locations 
as part of the team that's doing this work. Um, it was actually a great opportunity, and I learned a lot. Being new to Decennial, um, it was my first real opportunity to be able to go out and perform field work and gain that perspective. Um, so I found the work to be very, very interesting, and I think that we will gain a lot from the results that we're going to gather once the test completes. Um, driving 650 miles in three days was quite a challenge, but I did make it, and I did get to all of my locations. So um, it was great opportunity, and um, I also got to use the new laptop instrument that they're working on. So that's well underway, and I think the work is going very well. Once the operations complete, we will then have quality control work that's going to continue in the field until the 20th of February. A high-level test uh, census test summary, where we're going to test the feasibility of fully utilizing the field operations management system that leverages planned, planned automation and available real-time data, as well as households have already provided the government to transform the efficiency and effectiveness of data collection operations. We are looking to reduce NERFU workload and increase NERFU productivity with administrative records, field reengineering, re and adaptive design. And we are also testing the implementation of the bring your own device option for enumerators. The high level status update for this test is as follows. We have submitted our OMB package to the Department of Commerce on the 2nd of December. Our field test is completed and baselined. Our, in, our integrated schedule, as Deirdre mentioned this morning, was baselined on December 21st, and we're making, uh, December 31st, I'm sorry, and we're making some final um, revisions to the schedules after we get through our on-site, off-site next week. Our low-level solution requirements, we've been finalizing as necessary. Our form content and design is completed and locked down. The local census office build out, the lease is signed in October, and the build, act, build out activities began in December. And our systems completed a release three development and testing for the NERFU systems. Um, we are recruiting staff that began, and testing sessions have also began. And we are on track for our April 1st census day. In the next 90 days, we will obtain the OMB number and prepare printed and online materials. We'll finish the tweaks that we're going to make to the schedule, as mentioned earlier. We're beginning our recruiting activities, um, and that's going to continue through March of 2015. And with our training, we will, pr we will print our control training materials the week of February 16th, and our tra trained field operation supervisors the week of March 23rd. And for our systems, we're going to complete the release for development and testing activities, prepare for our user acceptance testing, and we will go through our systems readiness activities for self-response operations. Moving on to the optimizing self-response test. The objectives are to conduct early research on the use of advertising, promotion, and outreach to engage and motivate respondents. We will determine the extent to which we will use early engagement, such as Notify Me. We will assess the operational feasibility of real-time non-ID processing and the potential resulting workloads for system development. And we will study the extent to which encouraging responses without a census ID will contribute to the national self-response and internet response rates. The status report for this test is as follows. The OMB package was also submitted to the Department of Commerce on the 2nd of December. Our integrated schedule is complete and we are making final revisions. The form content and design is completed and locked down. Our user acceptance test for Centurion in the phase one operations is currently underway. The low level solution requirements we are finalizing as we go. And April 1st, is we're still on track to meet our April 1st census day. In the next 90 days, we will gain um, approval by OMB and have the number and prepare and print online materials. Um, integrate our schedule, it will be finished. The low level solution requirements will be complete and baselined. And the systems, we will complete all of our user acceptance testing and our systems readiness activities. 
And finally, the national content test, the summary information, is that we will use a large nationally representative sample to ensure representation of race and ethnicity groups. The test will inform language support plans and refine estimates of national self-response and internet response rates. Content testing will focus on race and Hispanic origin, relationship, and within household coverage. And the test will include a content re-interview to examine accuracy measures for experimental content. A Federal Register pre-submission notice was published on December 2nd, and our 60-day comment period has commenced. The field test plan is also baselined. The business process models and project level business requirements are baselined. Our capability requirements have been turned over to our solution providers to be finalized. And we are on track for our census day of September 1st. And, and I just wanted to highlight that results from this test are not necessary for our September 2015 design decision, preliminary design decision. In the next 90 days, we expect to submit our full package to OMB. Um, the capability and solution requirements we will finalize as necessary and baseline. Our re-interview tool, we're going to determine the technology and complete our spe specifications. And with our schedule, um, the integrated project teams will finalize their pieces and the systems will finalize their pieces as well. I think the team has made a tremendous amount of project above progress. Um, we are moving into planning for the operations phases now, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the next several months play out, because I think it's going to be very exciting with the implementation of the new technologies. Thank you. Are we doing Q&A now? Mm -mm. All right, thank you, Jill. Um, <clears throat> my name is Evan Moffat, uh, I spoke earlier. I'm going to apologize in advance because I am going to replow a little bit of the ground that we've already covered. Um, my goal today is to provide you with an overview of where we are in development of the 2020 address canvassing program as well as an up, update on the address validation test and its component parts. So before I get into AVT, I, I want to begin with this high level of overview of address canvassing. Um, the intent of this graphic is, is simply to provide that, that high-level overview. So at this point in the decade, we are looking at the various methodologies that we would implement in order to ensure that we build an accurate list of addresses in each block to meet the objectives of the 2020 census. Um, so in the top left-hand corner, you'll see that we have the how-to canvas element or component of the 2020 program. And in here, we are thinking about ways to establish via statistical models and geographic review um, to identify those areas that we would go to the field and canvas using an in-field methodology. We also think that this effort will help us identify um, areas, obviously, where we would in office canvas as well. And as was discussed this morning, this idea of in office canvassing is trying to drive at the cost savings associated with reducing the address canvassing infield workload down to 20 percent. Um, <clears throat> so in the right box, you see that um, there are a number of, of methods that are currently being examined related to how we would conduct the in-office canvassing operation. Um, we might use imagery. Well, we will use imagery, I believe. Um, administrative records, partner files, and such. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the in-field canvassing methodologies that are being examined the full block canvassing and the partial block canvassing. And, and we'll get to some of that with the uh, AVT work that's discussed in just a moment. <clears throat> in the bottom left, or the final component, and let me say a critical component, represents the quality of the frame and the quality of the data collection activities feeding 2020 address canvassing. Um, this includes inputs from statistical modeling efforts that'll measure the level of under coverage and over coverage. 
also leveraging the ongoing address frame maintenance and update activities and data. So what I mean by this is geography division on an annual basis processes DSF refreshes. There is the ongoing engagement through GSSI with partners um, and updates that are received from other census programs, whether it be um, current surveys or listing operations that occur in the field. So all of this will come together as, as was discussed this morning in this 2020 um, implementation plan. But one of the component parts of that is going to be a subset specifically focused on quality and how we ensure that we have complete coverage and we build the frame to provide that basis for the 2020 program. So this graphic represents a notional timeline for 2020 address canvassing. And I'm just gonna walk through it. Um, in FY15, we're gonna complete the address validation, address validation test, which examines our ability to use statistical models and geographic review to identify areas for infield canvassing and how we might conduct infield canvassing, whether it be, again, full block canvassing as we've traditionally done, or through this refined methodology of partial block canvassing. We're also gonna release the 2020 address canvassing impl implementation plan, which is gonna document how we're gonna pull all these pieces, parts together. And as stated earlier, this is going to feed the 2020 operational plan that the, the ConOps team has been working on. Also in 2016, we plan to implement address canvassing in, in advance of the 2017 test, which Jill identified, I believe, did you? Um, you did not, which will occur on April 1st. <laughs> um, uh, we are currently working on site selection to support that. Um, in addition, we are looking to implement an ongoing MAF coverage study that I mentioned earlier this morning. And the purpose of this would be to measure coverage in the MAF, inform the statistical modeling activities, and measure the quality of the in-canvassing, in-office canvassing operation. Um, we've had a number of discussions in-house, and we think that there is a, a reasonable investment to be made in going out and listing blocks on an annual basis to help us understand those three um, those three particular areas. Again, uh, coverage of the MAF, informing the statistical modeling, and measuring how well we are at um, our in-office canvassing. In 2017, we're gonna begin a series of system performance testing leading up to an operational readiness test the following year. As stated earlier, more information on how we will conduct 2020 address canvassing will be documented in the implementation plan as well as the operational plan. In the upcoming slides, I'm gonna discuss ongoing research that we will complete this fiscal year, which is critical to the planning process for 2020 address canvassing. The purpose of the address validation test is to help us assess the performance of the methods and models that will help us develop the address list and refine the workloads for the 2020 address canvassing program. As stated earlier, there are two components to this, the master address file, ma master address file model validation test, we call MMVT, and the partial block canvas test. MMVT will test our ability to use statistical modeling to measure uh, errors or to estimate errors in the math and identify areas of change. This work will inform where we conduct in-field canvassing. The partial block canvas test is a proof of concept of an alternative approach to canvassing which uses uh, these geographic review activities um, to identify portions of blocks that are undergoing change and then go out there and just list or capture that change that was identified via the geographic activities. From a data analysis perspective, we'll compare the data collected in the field with the predictors from the statistical models. This will allow us to estimate math errors, predict which blocks we would have selected for infield canvassing, and estimate results in blocks with no addresses. We'll also use data collected in the field to compare against predictors made based on aerial imagery and other geographic sources. Finally, we intend to use the results of MMVT to refine the statistical models 
and geographic review process and integrate them to the extent possible. Joe mentioned a, a moment ago that um, the MMVT field implementation is complete. Um, there was a national sample of 10,100 blocks, which represents just over a million um, addresses. Production, as I mentioned, production listing and listing check operations are complete. We ended up um, hiring 822, or uh, we ended up employing 822 listers to complete this work, and it was a combination of current survey fields, field staff, as well as new hires. And this is the traditional full block canvassing, so we went out, we verified, updated, added, deleted um, addresses. So we worked ground to book as we have in the past. And <clears throat> one of the things that makes this exercise different from the partial block canvas test is we use the automated listing and mapping instrument, which is our legacy system for capturing address updates in the field. The partial block canvas test uses the new instrument. There's just some key dates up here. Um, I think the important one, um, which I will highlight later, is this May 29th date, um, when we will have the results of AVT, both MMVT as well as Partial Block Canvas. We will have those results, and um, I believe that will allow us to report out at an upcoming um, PMR. As mentioned earlier, partial block canvassing is an opportunity to test this new methodology by which we use the geographic review process to identify only those portions of the block that are undergoing change, go out, list those portions of the block. Um, there are a number of questions that we are um, researching related to this data collection effort. The first is, can growth or change within the block be accurately isolated and listed while ignoring the stable portion of a block? The second is, can listers effectively follow instructions to list the block portion of interest. The third is, can this be done without compromising address coverage in the math? And fourth, can this be done at a net cost savings when compared to the traditional listing operation? For partial block canvas, 615 MMVT blocks were selected. Um, I believe that 26 or 27 people are either in the field or we go into the field to complete this work. Um, it's a combination of headquarters staff and regional office staff. And as I mentioned before, this data collection effort is using the Census Bureau's corporate listing and mapping instrument, the LIMA, and there is a new system around that called um, CLMS. Yeah, the corporate listing and mapping system, I believe is the correct solution. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the power in this solution is that it truly is corporate. There has been a team that's been brought together for the last, I would say, two years, year and a half, to define requirements to build core capabilities that not only meet the needs of the 2020 program, but also meet the needs of uh, the current surveys. This instrument will be used um, for current survey listing as well as time of interview, so it will help them relocate housing units that are selected for sample. So again, just a highlight from a schedule perspective, since Jill covered some of this already, the, the key date here is May 29th when we expect to have a completed AVT report, which will allow us to share the results at the July PMR. So in summary, the AVT work is informing the 2020 address canvassing implementation plan by focusing on statistical modeling's ability to estimate errors in the math and identify areas of change, which then will inform where we will conduct in-field canvassing. In addition, we'll have a better understanding of our ability to implement a geographic review process which identifies portions of blocks undergoing change, our ability to proceduralize that in-field data collection activity, um, for only that portion of the block that is experiencing change. So that concludes my portion. I believe I hand it down to Marianne.
Hello again. In this session, I'll present information pertaining to the 2015 census test in Maricopa County, Arizona. In the upcoming slides, I'll cover the following topics. Information about the test site, information on the sample design, I'll talk about the response modes. We'll discuss some details about self-response and non-response follow-up. We'll talk a little bit about the evaluation follow-up and end with information on testing a bring your own device. Jill covered the objectives of the 2015 test in her presentation. I'll not repeat this again, but provide this slide to you for context in case you look at the slide deck separate from all the other ones at some point in time in your leisure. The 2015 census test will be conducted in portions of Maricopa County, Arizona. 165,000 addresses will be selected. The non-response follow-up operation will include no more than 70,000 addresses. With 5,000 of that 70,000 addresses re-interviewed in the evaluation follow-up operation. Maricopa County was selected for three primary reasons. First, the diversity. The area includes a large Hispanic population, which has been hard to count in past censuses. Next, for its mobility. The area has a relatively transient population, where people in the area come and go after a short stay. And third, due to its close proximity of urban and suburban areas. Having these conditions in a site will allow us to gauge the impact of the various new processes on the response rates for his, the Hispanic population, as well as helping us to test the quality of administrative records that are available. It will also allow us to test new methods that will enable us to accurately identify where people should be counted as actual residents in the test area. And finally, to test how well real-time caseload assignments can improve how we assign and manage our staff in the field. I was hoping these colors would show up a little bit better. <laughs> um, block groups for the test were identified based on diversity of socioeconomic characteristics. The block groups in central Maricopa, which are shown in blue, which is sort of in the center top part of the map, were selected for their high concentrations of both vacant and Hispanic populations. Including these block groups will allow us to test administrative records objectives related to access and implementation in areas with high concentrations of both vacant and Hispanic populations. The second set of block groups are located in the cities of Chandler and Mesa, shown in yellow and pink respectively. Both of these areas, or for both of these areas, the Census Bureau identified areas with higher 2010 census return rates and lower mobility. Including these areas allows the testing of performance of administrative records in areas with the high return rates and low mobility. The third set of block groups is the outer ring of block groups on the northern border of Maricopa County that is shown in green including these block groups will allow us to test in a more remote location. The Maricopa sample design is a two-stage sample design with three panels, which I'll discuss in a little more detail later. The sample size for the Maricopa site is driven by the need to ensure a sufficient workload for non-response follow-up to allow for comparing key metrics of efficiency and quality. For the non-response follow-up strategy, a power analysis was conducted to detect a difference for the productivity rate, where the productivity rate is the estimate of cases attempted per hour. In this test, we expect to be able to detect statistically significant differences between the panels of 0.12 cases per hour. One of the objectives of this test is to measure how cost parameter estimates compare from the two experimental panels to our control panel. Assumptions were made for mail return rate and the administrative record removal for the two experimental panels. These assumptions led to the identification of 250 block groups. The goal is to have 20,000 non-response follow-up cases per panel. The block groups were randomly allocated to the three panels. 
Since the experimental panels have more cases removed due to administrative records, they had additional block groups allocated. The sample design projects to have about 22,000 non-response follow-up cases in each panel. An additional subsampling operation of block groups will happen after the initial mail-out to reduce the sample to about 20,000 non-response cases. Since we are measuring cost implications, we are subsampling the block groups so we can measure cost implications of attempting to enumerate an entire block group. The significant difference testing took into account this additional subsampling. To further reduce respondent burden, any addresses selected for the American Community Survey will be excluded from our sample selection. I should say the 2015 American Community Survey. The test will not include any field quality control operations. And Census Day, as Jill mentioned, is April 1st of this year. The test will employ four response modes. An internet response mode, self-response with a paper questionnaire, computer-assisted telephone interviewing, meaning telephone questionnaire assistance, and computer-assisted personal interviewing in non-response follow-up. In addition, the test will allow for responses from respondents who do not have a unique census ID at the time of the response. Accepting responses without a unique ID will allow us to test our ability to increase self-response rates and reduce respondent burden. Non-ID cases will be validated against our address frame. The key measure for non-ID data collection is the number of non-ID cases successfully resolved through automated matching and geocoding in subsequent batch processing. The primary objective of the self-response component of the test is to experiment with different methods of maximizing self-response to increase the number of cases that respond online. All addresses in the Maricopa site sample will be sent an internet push mail contact asking them to respond to the census questionnaire on a secure internet site or by calling the telephone questionnaire assistance number to provide their responses. Two reminder postcards will be sent in each of the two weeks following the initial mail out. The second reminder will only be sent to non-respondents. Approximately three weeks after the initial notification, we will send a, finder remind, a final reminder along with a paper questionnaire that's either bilingual or English to non-respondents. We estimate that one-third of the non-respondents will receive a bilingual form. The, the determination of which cases will receive the bilingual form was based on applying the 2010 algorithm to the most recent ACS data. Respondents will be instructed to complete the return and return the census questionnaire, or they can choose to respond online or by calling telephone questionnaire assistance. A major objective of the 2015 census test in, Mar in the Maricopa site is to evaluate the difference in productivity rates between the control panel and our, and our alternative experimental panel treatments. The alternative treatments vary the approach by removing cases from the NERFU workload prior to field work and changes, contact, and changes contact strategies for cases that are visited in the field. It also varies the way cases are managed behind the scenes. Data collection for non-response follow-up will be done with a handheld device. For the 2015 census test, the non-response follow-up panels will consist of approximately 60,000 non-responding cases that are relatively evenly split between the three panels. The three panels include a control panel and two experimental panels. The adaptive design and administrative record treatments will be applied to the two experimental panels. I'll now talk a little bit about the three panels. First, the control panel will employ similar non-response follow-up procedures to those used in the 2010 census. We will have a traditional local census office located in Maricopa County. Enumerators will be instructed to make no more than six contact attempts. The first contact attempt must be made in person with no more than two additional in-person attempts. The main difference from the 2010 census is that enumerators will use an automated instrument instead of paper for the field data collection. To simulate 
the 2010 methods, the enumerator will leave a notice of visit requesting that the respondent call the enumerator to schedule an appointment for the enumerator to return to collect information from the respondent should the respondent not be at home when first visited. The control panel will use the same operational control system as that used in the 2014 census test. Panel two is the full administrative records removal panel, which implements an adaptive design contact strategy and will reduce the initial workload for NERFU to exclude any housing units identified as vacant or occupied based on administrative records. The work will be managed out of the AOSC running out of the Denver Regional Office and monitored at an AOSC located here at headquarters. Vacant housing units will be identified by using the undeliverable as addressed information from the United States Postal Service. Occupied units will be identified based on administrative records. For remaining NERFU cases, all units will be visited at least once. The re-engineered field work and adaptive design procedures will be utilized to determine the number and timing of visits. If the enumerator cannot reach a person an in, or cannot reach someone during an in-person contact attempt, the enumerator will leave a notice of visit with information for the respondent to either respond via the internet or through calling telephone questionnaire assistance. This panel will use the enhanced operational control system developed by the rocket team discussed earlier today. This slide just provides you um, a graphic that for the full administrative records removal panel. And I believe you've seen something similar to this in past presentations. Panel three is the hybrid administrative records removal panel, which implements an adaptive design contact strategy and will reduce the initial workload for non-response follow-up to exclude any housing units that were identified as vacant using administrative records prior to any contact attempts being made. For all housing units that have not been removed due to vacancy, enumerators will make one personal visit. After the initial personal visit, the remaining NERFU workload will be further reduced to remove any housing units that could be enumerated using administrative records. The methods to reduce the NERFU workload using administrative records are, are the same as those that will be employed for panel two, the full administrative record removal panel. For remaining NERFU cases, all units will be visited at least once. The re-engineering field work and adaptive design procedures will be used to determine the number and timing of visits. Similar to panel two, if the enumerator cannot reach someone during the in-person contact attempt, the enumerator will leave the notice of visit with information for the respondent to respond via the internet or through calling telephone questionnaire assistance. This panel will also use the new operational control system developed by the rocket team. And again, I just provide an illustrative depiction of the um, hybrid ad rec removal panel. During the month of July of 2015, enumerators specially trained on re-interview techniques will conduct the evaluation follow-up operation. There are two major objectives for the evaluation follow-up. These are, first, to obtain the most accurate status of the housing unit on census day, and next, to identify people associated with an occupied housing unit during the calendar year, as well as their timing for association with that housing unit. This will help determine the most accurate household status and roster for census day. The evaluation follow-up sample will consist of approximately 5,000 cases subsampled from the non-response follow-up control panel cases where housing unit information collected in non-response follow-up is either different or conflicts with information we have from administrative records for that housing unit. The types of cases selected for the evaluation follow-up will include Cases where the non-response interview was conducted with a household member and the resulting population count is different from that that we have for, from our administrative records. We'll also select cases where the non-response interview was conducted by proxy and the resulting population count is different from that 
which we have from administrative records. The third set of cases will be selected where the address was determined to be occupied in the non-response interview, but where administrative records have determined it to be vacant. We'll next select cases where the address was determined to be vacant by the non-response interview and where administrative records has said that it is occupied. We'll also select non-response proxy cases where the administrative records determination was occupied. And finally, cases where the administrative records composition changed from the previous year. This evaluation will collect information on all people associated with the housing unit during the calendar year to help assess the accuracy of the rosters and administrative records. In the 2015 census site test, we will also conduct an additional, an additional non-response follow-up data collection activity to test bring your own device. The test will occur after the non-response follow-up completes. Enumerators will be recruited from those who participated in the non-response follow-up control panel and who have a mobile device that meets the operating system specifications for iOS and Android platforms. The enumerators will use their own device for this data collection. The sample size for this component of the test is 5,000 addresses that were not included in other test activities. This is a technical implementation. So in other words, the data collected on the device is not what's driving the data collection. The driver is the process for utilizing someone's personally owned device. So therefore, it's safe to say that if anything would happen such that we can't complete all the 5,000 5, cases, we'll be all right. The objectives of the test include the design, development, deployment, and support of secure software solutions that can be installed on an employee's personally owned mobile device, conducting interviews with respondents using the enumerator-owned mobile devices, and capturing lessons learned for future operations, including focus groups with a subset of the respondents, questionnaires for enumerators, and collection of feedback from the local census office. Feedback from the enumerators and the local census office will be used to shape NERFU duties using BYOD and future census site tests. And with that, I believe I now pass to Steve, and I'm not throwing it. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Buckner. I'm the Assistant Director for Communications, and I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to give you a status uh, report on where we're at with our communications research that we're going to be doing in the Savannah media market uh, here this spring. Uh, let me start just by saying that we have a dedicated team of professionals and contract staff that are working on this test, and I'm really excited about the progress we've made since October. Um, it is a cross-directorate team uh, comprised of decennial IT, communications, field, and research and methodology directorates coming all together with some really intriguing ideas about how we might be able to um, move communications to the next level and really motivate self-response um, and allow the public to be able to respond anywhere and anytime um, at their convenience. And that's sort of where the optimizing self-response test is really trying to go. It's making it as easy as possible for the American public to respond to the census. Uh, with all the other operations that are being fed underneath of that. So let me just briefly start. These are the goals of the entire 2015 test that we've gone over a little bit earlier uh, today and this afternoon. Um, but just as a refresher, you can see that we're really focused in on trying to increase the opportunities to engage hard to enumerate populations as well as trying to make sure that uh, we can increase the self-response rate while reducing any kind of differential um, or non-response follow-up and related cost. So specifically for the 2015 uh, Savannah Media Market Test, uh, where we're trying to optimize in self-response, these are the uh, objectives that we are trying to meet. Um, recall that this is really the first time that we've had the opportunity to test digital and micro-targeted digital advertising, uh, which is really instrumental for the overall planning of the 2020 communications program. Uh, site selection, as I mentioned in our last briefing, was really key. Um, the Savannah media market with its 20 counties is a medium-sized media market here in the U.S. 
uh, and it is ranked about 92nd out of the 210 markets. Um, that is important because we chose that site not only based on the demographics and having a good representative sample uh, with different population groups, but it also gave us um, some efficiencies when it came to the actual media buy. So it's a lot cheaper to do some advertising in the Savannah media market than, for, a, for example, than a top tier uh, market such as New York, Chicago, or Dallas. Uh, so as a result, just for some of the digital advertising that we're going to be doing, we're going to be spending about seven cents on the dollar compared to what we'd have to spend for digital advertising in one of the previous markets I just mentioned. Uh, in terms of the uh, overall research goal, you could see here that uh, we're really trying to look at the effects. There we go. Uh, really trying to look at the effects of integrating and combining digital advertising and micro-targeted ads with the other traditional communications things that uh, you're very familiar with from both the 2000 and 2010 census. Each time uh, we've taken and set a new bar uh, in terms of the communications and outreach program and tried to tailor that to very specific audience groups, whether that be in-language ads or outreach materials to uh, trans-creative stuff that really resonated with different populations. Uh, as we move towards 2020, it's all about personalization and making sure we get the right message to the right person at the right time. Um, so as we move into the overall research questions that we're looking at, uh, research question one, uh, what are the effects of micro-targeted digital advertising on a couple different factors? So I'll just go briefly through uh, some of those bullets for those of you uh, watching online. Uh, internet, we want to understand the, uh, the impact on internet and overall self-response rates. We're looking at how the internet and self-response rates of different specific socioeconomic and demographic groups are measured through different geographic areas. So in this case, we're actually going all the way down to the zip code area, the way we've designed the research. Uh, we're looking at the internet and self-response rates of housing units that rece receive specific uh, mailing strategies, such as the push that you just heard about, or the pre-registration pre notify me um, strategies, or even the non-ID push, as well as just looking at the overall notify me rates and the types of impact that we can have using uh, communication tactics such as digital and targeted outreach. Our second question relates to that first overall uh, research question along the same types of factors, but the difference here is that we're going to be trying to combine looking at high levels of spend in a couple of the panels versus low levels of spend. So the variation of the media buy and the outreach we do could vary across the different research panels that we're going to be going over. So I did talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of digital advertising at the last one. I'm going to go back through these because I think they are important. Um, the benefits of traditional averaging, which will always remain part of the mix that we're doing, um, but there are a lot of new ways to reach people, uh, both online and they all each have unique benefits. So if you see here that it's definitely a little bit uh, more affordable to get into the market and do digital ads versus perhaps a television ad or something else that's a little bit more costly to produce. Um, you can have real-time feedback in terms of how people are reacting to that particular creative uh, pieces of, of information. And you can do a lot of testing and piloting of different things. So you could put something out in market and also pull it back if it's not performing very well. So it allows you the ability to quickly change strategies if something's not working. And I think that's really important as we move forward into 2020. Now, um, another benefit, and I alluded to um, this was some research that we've been looking at and is going out in the industry right now across the marketplace. Uh, traditional advertising, the percent of allocations that, that private sector um, companies are using in terms of pushing towards traditional media versus digital. We've seen the traditional is going down, television, the percent that are going on television and other medias are going down, while the percent spends on digital is going up. Um, so as a comparison for this 2015 test as part of our media buy, um, whereas in the 2010 census we allocated just about 8% of the total media buy on digital ads, uh, in 2015 we're spending five times that. So we're up over 40% while television will be dramatically down. So if it's almost a, a little bit of a role reversal, but that's where the industry and the market is taking us. So the uh, types of digital and micro-target advertising, you'll see here, the, here are the, what we refer to as digital advertising. Um, you have four different um, factors here. Recall that we're referring to online ads in any platform 
that are designed for consumption by mass audience. That's what we mean by digital advertising. Uh, the micro-targeted digital advertising really refers to online ads in any platform that were designed for a specific population in terms of messaging, language, or placement. And while we can create micro-targeted digital advertising for any audience, we're especially aiming those individuals to reach uh, audiences that are hard to count or that have historically had a low self-response rate. Uh, and here's sort of how we're defining the four main types of digital micro-targeted advertising that we'll use during the 15 test. So here's a couple of examples that um, as we're still, sort of still in the process of, de of designing our advertising and our targeted plans, uh, the two examples here just to give you sort of a range. So if we're talking about demographic, um, looking at trying to target those that are 65 uh, and older in Beaufort County, South Carolina, um, it would be a demographic type of target that we would do versus a behavioral where we're targeting specific uh, zip codes in, let's say, Chatham County, Georgia, that have visited Spanish language websites in the past. So you can see how those just sort of factor in as, as possible examples of how we might do different targeting. So here is the sort of final research panel uh, that we've come up with. So working with the Research Methodology Directorate, uh, we have finalized our research panel design and we actually added a fifth panel since the last PMR, what we're calling Panel E. Uh, that panel will not receive any digital media, um, but will serve as sort of a control condition for all the other communication tactics that will be employed during the test. The other four panels are cross-targeted and non-targeted advertising and spending level, which sort of correspond to the research questions that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. So if you look at the uh, targeted column, uh, panel A and C, they both will receive targeted advertising as well as general advertising, uh, but at different spending levels. While panels B and D on the other column under non-targeted will only receive general digital advertising, but also at different spending levels. All panels, uh, which include panel E, will be exposed to all of the outreach area, uh, sort of the traditional tactics that we've done in a census environment, which include television advertising, radio ads, earned media, uh, phone calls by partners, social media, and partnership efforts. In terms of looking at the types of audience allocation, so how are we allocating that across the five uh, research panels? Uh, first, it's imperative to note that we will be purchasing digital advertising by zip code as that is the precise as we can be um, using the most digital, uh, extens existing digital advertising technology. So there are about 106 zip codes within the Savannah media market. Uh, we use these eight demographic characteristics, age 18 to 24, age six, 65 plus, so you see we had a couple different age groups, renters, uh, percent that were African American, percent of households with children that have children under six, those with less education, uh, and also uh, you see internet access and those that have female head of households. These are all sort of characteristics that we mapped evenly across the research panels um, and put through a uh, Monte Carlo assimilation. The uh, first seven obviously are very closely related, if you're no stranger to the census, are very closely related to low self-response rates from previous censuses as well as the American Community Survey data that we've been looking at as we design the research. Uh, additionally, we used internet access uh, data uh, so that we would have an even distribution between wired and less wired households across um, the five panels in the Savannah media market. Ultimately, we selected a design that tried to maximize the parity between these eight demographic uh, panels while also trying to maximize the geographic closeness of the research. Uh, the panels uh, and the closeness is a way to try to keep the bleed across the panels at a minimum um, and the uh, consumption of advertising by the respondent outside of the assigned panel that they're in. So we are trying to look at that so we can actually measure what works in each panel. Here's a uh, graphical depiction uh, sort of segmentation that we did uh, by zip code. So using all those things that I just discussed, you can kind of see what our final design looks like. This map is a little hard to decipher up on the thing. Uh, if you want to refer back to the presentation, it's a little bit easier. Uh, but we're looking at, um, we've separated out South Carolina up in the 
upper right corner just so you could see the three counties. But again, it is broken up by zip code. That's why you have those different colors. Uh, but each one is uh, color coded to the various panel of which the zip code is in. So the purple panel corresponds to panel A, which is the high spin with targeting. That's about 32 counties in the market. Blue corresponds to panel B, uh, which is a high spin but no targeting, and that's about 21 counties. Green is the low spin panel C, which has targeting, that's about 24 counties. And red is our low spin with no targeting, which is also panel D, that is about 15 counties. And then finally, the yellow is our control panel with 14 counties. Uh, you heard a little bit about um, some of the calls that have been going on um, during the census test and research. Um, we're taking um, a stab at it as well from a communication standpoint. So we're actually embedding a smaller test to show the effectiveness of perhaps using influencer phone calls uh, to encourage self-response. Past research has shown mixed results on the overall uh, successfulness of that. However, we think that uh, this is a good opportunity to determine whether or not we'll continue to explore this tactic from a communications front. Uh, so if we observe a positive effect on the phone calls uh, during the test, we may consider using them in additional uh, tests in 16 and 17. Of the households that are not receiving any type of mailing during the 15 test, we are selecting 60,000 households to receive phone calls. Um, we're going to also attempt to observe the effect of using different voices for these calls. Uh, so whether or not uh, that be a community leader or an elected official or even a national voice, um, is there any variance in terms of how people may respond to getting a phone call from one of those individuals? Um, and these calls will be randomly distributed across the five panels. Here we are looking at the overall, uh, there we go, communications timeline. So we do t intend to separate the advertising into two phases. One is sort of an educational that will begin with the uh, notify me where uh, respondents in the Savannah Media Mart can actually select um, an option of how they would like to be contacted by the census when it's ready to respond through the notify me. Uh, and then later on in March, uh, we will be implementing our motivation call to action to actually get people to try to respond online to the census. Uh, here we have called out some specific dates in terms of the milestones just for a quick reference. Again, I mentioned the, the kickoff really begins on February 23rd uh, as part of the notify me advertising begins. Uh, and then on March 23rd, we actually move into that motivational where we actually open it up and try to get people to respond online. You'll see that the advertising actually wraps up on May 31st. So where are we at in terms of uh, some other things? Uh, so we've done a lot uh, over the course of November and December. Uh, we've done some partnership site visits uh, where a team of contractors and staff actually went into the Savannah Media Market and met with local leaders and community officials to try to get a sense for what's going on in the media market right now so we could craft the effective messaging and the creative to, that would resonate with the population there. Um, they also scouted uh, some video and uh, photo uh, locations that would build into the creative that we're actually producing. Uh, we've recently reviewed a lot of concepts that have come in through, and I've got a couple examples here later in the presentation that I'm gonna just give you examples of, but uh, these are sort of creative concepts that we're exploring using within the Savannah Media Market as part of the test. And then actually production dates, believe it or not, uh, we're kicking off uh, on January 15th, so we're about 10 days out um, from that time period. Uh, this is where we'll start doing uh, some of the television and other more um, production areas that need a little bit more lead time than some of the digital stuff. Uh, here you'll see just one creative treatment uh, that is being considered that they're taking into testing in the market. This is what we call make it count. Again, these are only illustrative based on some of the feedback that we've gotten from the local areas. This has not gone into uh, production yet, uh, but they're exploring it uh, and giving us feedback. So this is just one example. It says our dreams, our voice, our future, make it count. Participate in the 2015 census test today. Uh, here you can see how we're trying to actually localize the message. Uh, these are just perhaps posters. They could be digital ads. They could be part of another part of the campaign. But you see here we say we are Bullock County or we are Savannah. We count. So it allows you to personalize it a little bit and put it in a market to where it resonates a little bit with the local population. And then here another treatment where uh, trying to really uh, get the feel for the local area and pull on uh, the, the civic pride of the location of which people live in. So by identifying various city uh, names or things that people identify with, 
and giving some good visual evidence and uh, to allow people to think about and, and try to motivate them to actually participate uh, in the census. Again, these are just brief examples of some of the things that we're exploring, uh, but as you can see, uh, they do go around sort of the benefits message that we've used in previous censuses that seems to work very well and that we always work with the local leaders to sort of get out as, as far as the partnership and other outreach efforts. Uh, speaking of partnerships and some of the other outreach we're doing, um, most of the material we're doing is already on the 2015 test website that is officially launched. So that's a great way to keep in touch with what's going on with the test. We also have a pretty robust 20 census website that is growing with a lot of materials. All the materials today on, on the Ustream broadcast as well as um, that are in the materials for everyone today are online and uh, downloadable. Uh, we have developed a lot of talking points and fact sheets for uh, some of the partnership efforts that are going to kick off here over the next several weeks. Uh, we did hire a uh, regional partnership specialist down out of the Atlanta region that actually is from the Savannah area and has worked on uh, a census before. We're really excited about bringing him on board and uh, also a, um, a clerk that's going to help him uh, conduct the outreach across the 20 counties. And we're in the process of uh, developing partnership training um, and integrating those with all the materials. Here's uh, just a screenshot of some of the 2015 census test stuff where you can actually go and get some of the latest news. Um, moving on, this is sort of a more specific site that will be growing, uh, focused specifically on the Savannah area, the Savannah Media Market Test, um, explaining to individuals what's going on so you can expect to see more information going on there as well. Something I'm really excited about that has been a uh, fantastic um, effort that's been going on here, um, something called customer experience management. It's basically trying to take customer analytics from all the information that we gather around the Census Bureau, how we're interacting with customers and pulling it into a data store that we can actually visualize what's going on with our customers, what are they trying to tell us, whether it's through the telephone, through our website, through social media. Um, through our call centers that we have. We've prototyped something down in the Center for, Center for Applied Technology, the CAT. Um, it is coming out of uh, that, that pilot production stage and actually moving in uh, to production with the help of IT. We are standing this up for the 2015 census test so that we can have near real-time data about response rates, the advertising and, and how successful those individual ads are doing so that we can actually make some decisions on and see real time and, and try to make uh, adaptations. We tried to do this during the 2010 census, um, but given the fact that a lot of the media was not digital, it was very hard. It would, the lead time would take three, four days to get an ad pulled and changed. This way we can actually see how things are resonating. We can mine down into the data by zip code and actually see the response rate and do we need to deploy perhaps more partnership efforts in one area because it's lagging below the rest of the set test site. So this is a good trial period for us too, as well as a management device to actually see how things are performing and then pivot if we need to based on the overall. Um, so we're really excited about that um, and trying to uh, move forward. Um, the as I mentioned, we're going to be able to do it through sort of a customized set of dashboards um, that would be pulling from website metrics, um, advertising metrics from the actual ad buy themselves, as well as the response rates coming in from the Centurion system. So we're in the process of working heavily with IT and Decennial on pulling the right data together so that we can um, get this information across the various management streams. This is just a real rough sketch. It doesn't do it justice when you're sitting and looking at the monitor and how quickly the data populates. I'd be happy to do a demonstration at any point once we get it stood up. Um, but right here, you're just looking at sort of the, the types of visualizations and the dashboards that you can actually see from some of the data sets. Uh, here specifically, it, it perhaps is looking at, at some of the web hits, some of the social media interactions, some of the call centers and things like that. But this just gives you sort of an eye and a glimpse into some of the potential not just for external data that we're doing, but any of the, the data that we're pulling internally and how we might be able to better manage by having the data because it's an enterprise system um, and it's sort of uh, extensible to pretty much anything internally or externally. So we are very excited about that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Kim. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, my name is Jenny Kim and I'll be discussing the 2015 National Content Test with you today, also referred to as, thank you, also referred to as the NCT. I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues, our subject matter experts from the Demographic Directorate and the Decennial Directorate who are here today and help compile the information that I'm going to share with you today. 
Um, at our last PMR in October, we went over the high-level descriptions of the NCT. So what I plan to do today is to share a more detailed look of the test and what we have been progressing so far. The NCT will take place in late summer of 2015 with a census date of September 1st. We'll be using a nationally representative sample, including Puerto Rico, with oversampling of key population groups. The sample will include approximately 1.2 million households, with the specific sample design currently under development. What we plan to accomplish through the NCT is to test the key content areas related to race and Hispanic origin, relationship, and within household coverage. Through this test, we'll be continuing our testing on contact strategies for optimizing self-response, particularly internet response, building on our tests from the 2014 and the spring of 2015. Mostly these strategies are related to the timing and the format of the mailings and the reminders. Um, we've already discussed with you that the NCT will include a content re-interview operation to further assess the accuracy and the reliability of our question alternatives for race and Hispanic origin as well as the within household coverage. The, the re-interview sample will include approximately 100,000 cases. The NCT will be a self-response test only and will not have a non-response follow-up operation. Right. The NCT has three key objectives related to content, contact strategies, and language. I'd like to first focus your attention to the first, which is content that's broken down by race and Hispanic origin, relationship, and within household coverage. The NCT will be our primary mid-decade opportunity to compare different content strategies prior to making final decisions for the 2020 Census content. Um, may, may, many of you may be aware, but I, as a reminder, by early 2017, the 2020 Census topics must be submitted to Congress, and by 2018 April, we need to uh, submit the final question wording. With the respect to race and Hispanic origin question, following up on our successful strategies of the 2010 AQE that Mike had already mentioned, we've been developing refinements to focus on the several key dimensions for improving our question on race and Hispanic origin, which I'll, I'll explain more in the subsequent slides. Um, but in the meantime, these dimensions include the question format where we are continuing our research on the combined question approach versus the separate question approach. The response categories where we will be exploring ways to collect and tabulate data for respondents of the Middle Eastern, North African, and Arab heritage, also referred to as MENA. Wording of the instruction, then the question terminology, we'll, we'll be examining ways to examine detailed uh, reporting of race and Hispanic origin data, and also improving respondents' understanding for the options to report multiple race and ethnic data. We'll especially be using web-based technologies such as the internet, smartphone, tablet, telephone to enhance question designs to optimize the reporting of the detailed racial and ethnic groups. I've never been a remote control person, I apologize. <laughs> All right, here we go, we're on the screen. Okay, what you're seeing on this slide are some examples of the alternative question format approaches that we're testing for collecting the data on race and Hispanic origin. If I can direct your attention to the left side where it says separate questions, you can see that this is one of the approaches that we're using um, that uses two separate questions. As you can see on number eight, um, that is the question about the Hispanic origin, and then the second about race on question nine. Now, shifting to the right side where it says combined question, this approach combines the two items into one question about race and origin. All right, now, with respect to the response categories, we'll be evaluating the use of the MENA category, the Middle Eastern or North African, in the race question. The graphic on the left illustrates one example of our research designs where the MENA category is placed among the options for selecting a major race or ethnic category. Now, taking a closer look, if you look on the right side where it's amplified, the image on the right shows the MENA category along with the six example groups and a dedicated write-in space for entering detailed ethnicity, such as Lebanese and Egyptian. 
With respect to the wording of the instructions, our current paper version of the instructions states, mark one or more boxes and print your specific origins. Based on the 2010 AQE and feedback from our advisory committees, respondents frequently overlook the instruction to mark one or more boxes. So as a result, our new instruction will say mark all boxes that apply. Now this is our, our attempt to improve the clarity of the question and to make it more apparent that more than one group may be selected. Shifting your attention to the question terminology, the current version of the race and ethnic origin questions uses the words race and or origin to describe the concepts and the groups. Recent focus groups and quality of research has informed us that the word origin is confusing or misleading to many respondents, um, may th in many thinking that this is about where they immigrated from, where they were born. Now, the exact terminology to be used for the alternative version is pending cognitive testing and usability testing, which is being conducted earlier this year. With the advantage of the new uh, technology to collect data through the web-based designs, we'll be also testing a combined question with detailed checkboxes for soliciting detailed race and ethnic origins. So on the initial screen, a combined question will collect the data on the major OMB categories. And then for any of the categories that are selected, a subsequent internet screen will present the detailed checkbox groups and also a dedicated writing area. So if you look here, for example, uh, the screen will collect the detailed responses for the specific Hispanic groups, such as Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, et cetera. And then in a similar fashion, a screen will collect detailed responses for specific black groups, such as African American, Jamaican, Haitian, et cetera. Additional screens will also be available for other categories that are selected by the respondent. So for example here, um, if a respondent were to select Asian, a follow-up screen would collect detailed responses for the Asian groups such as the Chinese, Filipino, Asian, Indian, and et cetera. As you can see here, these web-based designs give us a lot more flexibility than the paper questionnaire. And we really believe that these new approaches will help us um, collect the data for the broader OMB categories as well as help us um, collect more detailed responses across all groups. Moving on to the relationship question, similar to the race and Hispanic origin question, we're examining the most effective way to gather information on relationship among household members. In particular, gathering information on same-sex married couples is increasingly important as this would inform planning for federal programs that rely on information on marital status. Uh, two versions of the relationship question will be tested. The first version that you see on the left will use the 2010 response options, but in a new order, starting with husband or wife, and then the unmarried partner category. The second version that you see on the right includes the same basic response options from the 2010 census, but expands and modifies the husband or wife and unmarried partner categories to distinguish between the same sex and the opposite sex relationships. This version also reintroduces the foster child category into the questionnaire. Uh, through the within household coverage question, we'll determine how many people live in each housing unit, in other words, where they, sleep, uh, where they live and sleep most of the time. We're going to test two designs to compare the different approaches for helping respondents provide a more accurate roster. The first version that you see there is the first, uh, the rule-based approach. This provides the respondents with the residence rule instructions and examples and asks them to apply these instructions and report a population count for the household. Now with this approach, we are expecting the respondent to interpret the rules correctly and provide the population count. The second version is a question-based approach where we ask guided questions to elicit a household roster. In this approach, respondents are not shown the residence rules, instructions, they're only asked to create an initial roster of people they consider to be living or staying at the address, and they are guided by questions such as who lives or stays here, and also follows up with questions that identify potentially missing people such as babies and those away in colleges and so forth. In this, we're going to take an advantage of the internet um, that will allow us to ask a series of questions required for this approach. Now through the re-interview operation, we will be examining which approach gives us a more accurate roster. And also through the re-interview operation, we will compare the number of people that are added, deleted, and the total roster changes. Now turning to the contact strategies, 
as we already mentioned, we'll be testing our contact strategies to encourage respondents to self-respond, particularly through the internet. Um, it's important that we consider a variety of options for finding the best contact strategies. The NCT will test nine different approaches, and it will help us determine the best um, strategies for collecting res um, contacting respondents who live in areas that are in high, medium, and low internet response rate areas. Uh, we'll also be building on lessons learned from prior testing in the ACS. So let's go and take a look at the nine approaches. Beginning with approach number one, the internet per strategy, um, which has been used in the most recent series of our self-response test, will be serving as our control panel. The motivation for our second panel is to study the timing of the reminders. So the hypothesis is that by sending the first reminder sooner, closer to the initial uh, internet push, we will provide for a better connection between those two mailings. Uh, for the motivation for the panels three to five are based on recent ACS research that actually found lower self-response rates in certain areas after the introduction of the internet options. So this reminds us uh, to be mindful of the fact that um, while we are striving in encouraging respondents to uh, reply via the internet that we also need to be cognizant of the fact that there are respondents who prefer not to use the internet option. Uh, through panel three to five, we'll be testing the delivery of the paper questionnaires at various points in the, in the process. And respondents in uh, panel five will receive the questionnaire first to address those populations who do not prefer to respond via the internet. The motivation for panel six is to further encourage self-response even after the questionnaire mailing, but prior to when we will conduct NERFU. As a reminder, the NCT will not be conducting a non-response operation. Panel seven will study the impact of sending a postcard at the first mailing instead of a letter. And then panel eight takes an approach where we do not send a mail questionnaire at all. And then lastly, uh, panel nine will build on what we learned from the 2014 census test, as uh, Mike Bentley had mentioned, that we cannot replace postal mail with email. So what we're going to do in this panel is uh, use email to supplement the postal email instead of completely replacing it. Now onto the language where we're going to test the two methods for offering Spanish language materials. In advance of our major language testing plans for 2016 and 17, where we plan to test instruments and materials in additional non-English languages, the NCT will have the internet instrument in English and Spanish, as well as a paper a bilingual questionnaire in English and Spanish as well. We will have telephone questionnaire assistance available in additional non-English and non-Spanish languages. Taking a look at the panels on the screen, in the mailings that contain a letter in the optimizing self-response panels, we'll be using different methods to encourage uh, response in Spanish. So different from the method used in 2014 census test where we provided the materials in English with a sentence in Spanish that provided the URL and a telephone number, we're actually going to mimic the same content in English into Spanish. So what we will do in that is providing equality between the content in English and the Spanish. The dual-sided letter will provide the English content on one side of the page and Spanish on the other. And then the swim letter, the swim lane letter is similar to the 2010 bilingual questionnaire that you may remember where it has uh, English on one side of the same page and Spanish on the other. So we'll be testing these two methods. Um, in addition, because research has shown us that non-English speaking respondents often don't open the packages not knowing that there are materials inside that are written in non-English languages, what we're going to do is we are going to have the URL and a brief message in both languages on the envelope this time. In terms of where we are with all the planning, um, Jill has already shared with you that we have prepared our uh, test plan and the uh, high-level schedule. Um, here is a link to the Federal Register for those of you who may be interested. We are currently in the 60-day period where we are uh, garnering uh, comments from the public. And this was posted on uh, December 2nd, so we will be, the 60-day period will come uh, shortly at uh, beginning of next month. Um, as we mentioned earlier that the NCT will be our primary mid-decade opportunity to compare the different content strategies prior to making final decisions to 2020 content, so it is very critical in our mid-decade testing. Um, the results of this test will inform the content topics in the final question wording for the 2010 cens 2020 census, excuse me, as, and as well as with the content and the topic that is um, 
that is decided for the 2020 census, this will also have an impact on the ACS. Well, that brings me to the end of um, my slides, and as well as all of our testing updates, I will hand this back to Deirdre. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Evan, Marianne, Stephen, and Jennifer. We've just shared a lot of information about the 2015 census tests. Uh, we'd be happy to entertain any questions now. The, uh, the math validation test uh, used modeling, and I was just wondering what were the sources of the data? The data we have come from the current sources, otherwise uh, 2013, uh, so some of this comes from census data. Some of this comes, this is Pat Cantwell from Census Bureau. Uh, it comes from a variety of sources, including administrative records that are available up to this point in time. Okay, specifically? Uh, I don't know the details of the files that they're using. Okay. But, but this, but this Trisha, is. Uh, similar to how we provided the list that we're using for the non-response follow-up workload, we could provide something, something similar after this meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. The important point is this is not just up until uh, the 20, 2009 period, as our uh, work for, based upon the 2010 census address canvassing results were. Hey, I have a question for Marianne and then one for um, Stephen. Uh, Marianne, you said for the, the 2015 test that the panels would be relatively evenly split. Is that? before the administrative records are used to clean out the workloads or after? I was just wondering like, if that's going to make the, um, oh, I guess Tom can answer that too. Is the control panel going to wind up being a lot larger than the experimental because of the cleanup? Or are they going to be even like once they've been cleaned up relatively? The, the 250 block groups, they have been randomly allocated to the three panels. The control panel has fewer block groups because since they do not have administrative records removed, we can get roughly to approximately 20,000 interviews. The other two panels have more block groups to also do account for to get to 20,000 to be able to move the vacants in the one panel before field work and also the full removal panel removing the vacants and the occupies. Right. Okay, all right. And then, um, see that question. Um, regarding the, uh, the targeting, that you're going to be doing, and I know that you guys probably put a ton of research into um, how you segmented the counties. Um, when you uh, measure, I guess, the response rates after the different types of advertising, are you going to look at historical data for those areas and demographics, or are you just going to compare them kind of across, like, did the high spend versus low spend do better, or did this area have a different level of response compared to the last test that we did in this area, or the last census? So I will attempt to answer that, and if Monica, if you want to jump in, let me know. Um, so we're going to be tagging each one of the ads um, within each panel. So we'll actually have what we call a campaign code, and you'll be able to grab metrics off of that particular ad and, and see how that resonated across the various groups, the eight different groups that I had on there in terms of audience segmentation. Um, we have the response rates in that area from obviously the last several censuses, so we could do some comparisons post afterwards. We have the response rates right now that we're looking at that helped identify this van and media market to begin with, but also by county and down to that block group level. So we know which tracks have been harder to count than others. And so that's going into the planning around the media strategy as well as the outreach strategy, particularly the partnership side, which is going to focus on you know, probably the 15% the hardest to to, to enumerate tracks, and then we'll be able to measure those impacts, and then a lot of the post-research will dive into, okay, what are the effects of that? The, the, the communications, the digital, the advertising, as well as the low and high are added factors to it, but we will try to do a sort of a longitudinal looking at how those response rates are by area. Okay, and then um, once you get those results, is the goal to figure out a global strategy, or will you continue to target just with a better kind of understanding of of which 
approach affects which demographic or area the best? That's a, that's a great question. So at the last one, we had talked that we had put out an RFI for um, some communication industry to ask some questions around this and other topics. So we've gotten back several responses. We're going through those um, as we build the solicitation around the communications contract that will help support increasing self-response. Um, our intentions at this point is absolutely to take every single bit of research that we learn through this test and apply it to not only subsequent tests, but help us build and better refine that contract so we have a better understanding. So we've seen a lot of the research that has showed where advertising is going and how are you better able to connect and get people, um, increase awareness and get them to convert into something. So by utilizing some of this data, we may have a much better understanding going into this cycle than we've ever had before. Coupled with all the other data that we're pulling, um, I, I think we're gonna be in a much better position um, the, the the analytic stuff that I talked about too, we're going to be grabbing that, and so we'll have baselines by day, so we can actually start looking at how many people are responding or what percent of the population is responding by day. We have that probably from the 14 test, so we'll start building that into because I know that IT is you know wanting to make sure what are the load capacities that we're going to need to do as we move into a decennial cycle, and particularly since this is an April 1st census, it it does really mirror more of the census time frame. So we'll be able to start building those simulations as well in terms of not only load, but what we might be able to do. So if we, if we place an ad and, and we see a spike, we might be able to build in some assumptions into our strategy and timelines as we move into 2020. So it's, it's the very first part of it. We're excited we're started this early because I think it does open up a lot of possibilities to really maximize response. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Carol Rice with the IG. Um, I know this isn't group quarters testing, but did you consider in the Savannah media market looking at the college students? Because that's when you talk about this, some of this, this stuff that I don't do. College students, I think, do do it, and that's sort of a good ah, market to, to test. And I know that's one of your hard-to-count populations. Yeah, certainly. Uh, 18 to 24 uh, is, is one of the groups that we're actually looking at. Um, and one of the things about the Savannah media market is we did have some universities and colleges within that. Uh, you have Georgia Southern and Statesboro as well as uh, some of the Savannah stuff. Um, we met with several um, academics there um, at the various colleges uh, between uh, the contractors and the staff from communications here as well as uh, Mr. Moore's team um, from Chicago who's looking at and trying to help us build the partnership plan moving into 2020 had some people on the ground and one of the initiatives he's looking at is how do we better utilize co colleges and universities to actually reach students um, that gets into group quarters but also off-campus housing um, and we've used a, a variety of different techniques over the last couple censuses to reach college students but I think that the benefit that we have here that we haven't had in the previous censuses is the online technology and the, the possibility of using this non-ID concept. Um, it's very limiting to have to go back and find an ID in this society as we live now where it's immediate, uh, I have time, I want to just go do it, to not have to look up a number and do it. That You can answer a couple quick questions and it maps back automatically on that back end. So I think it does make it a lot more accessible to that population that's very mobile to be able to do it anytime on their mobile device because we'll have all that optimized. Now, as we move forward 2020, it could be an app, it could be a lot of different things in terms of how we open that up, but I think the technology definitely skews towards that next-gen generation in terms of trying to get them to respond to it. So are you testing it in the Savannah media market or no? Which, which part? I mean, just, just the student population. They, they are part of they the, are part the individual of the, okay. panel, so we should be able to align that based on the zip codes and how we can mine through the data but we'll definitely take that back and make sure we come back to you with something. Hi, hi Ty Mitchell, Government Accountability Office. Thanks again for the data dump. I think I've got just three quick ones here. Uh, on the 15 test, uh, the multi-unit, all the issues with access to multi-units, I know it's probably hard to design this into uh, a panel or anything, but are you planning to collect information systematically somehow so that after the fact, you'll be able to discern which approaches for multi-units had success. Um, I mean, there's a lot of ad hocery involved in the situations and whatnot, but there was a question earlier about how you're gonna deal with that, and it sounded like that might still be kind of in flux, how, what kind of guidance people are gonna get on, and what the supervisors are gonna do when they get that phone call, but is there some way to capture what in fact were the solutions in some of those cases so that you can draw something specific from it? 
Yes, uh, like I said earlier, these are the preliminary findings from the test. We will be finalizing our assessments. Uh, we are documenting uh, anecdotally what was successful in the field in terms of how the enumerators interacted with the building management, with the people at the gates um, to determine how best to move forward with the 2015 test. Uh, something else to consider is the use of the automated operational control system and the automated management of cases now and how we interact with our enumerators uh, digitally. It'll be much easier to do that in the 2015 test. So we will document our findings as part of our formal assessment. We will incorporate those into the 2015 test and that'll give us another opportunity to refine and enhance for 16, um, which will be even bigger tests than we've conducted thus far. Thank you. Yeah, it was a 15 I was thinking of. If you're thinking in how to systematically track some of that so that it's easier to pull those, those lessons learned afterward, that just, just, just a thought. Uh, uh, let's see. The evaluation follow-up sample design, is that, is that finalized? At this point, it's going to be a selection of cases coming out of the non-response follow-up with comparisons to the administrative records result, plus also the last group of cases based on identifying uh, cases based on their administrative record compositions from two, pre two previous years. But is in, I mean, are you going to think through before it, you pull the trigger on executing it, how many of which you're trying to get or? With up to 5,000, we'll keep track since it's based on NERFU workloads. Whichever, you know. whichever one's happened right, first. Right. That, okay. That's part of it. Okay. And it, will, and it will be an independent interview of those cases going out. Okay. Okay. And then lastly, uh, uh, I think Evan, uh, I'm looking at the MMVT. There's a bullet reviewing predictions based on aerial imagery and other sources is one of the outcomes. Um, is there a research design in place yet that's going to lay out um, uh, not just the aerial imagery versus other sources, but um, the, I'm imagining the different methods you use for, for the different methods for the in-office, what do you call it, in-office in canvassing. The, you've got an RFI that's coming out mm -hmm. soon. Um, is there a design that's going to try to literally line up the different ways using imagery? I imagine you've got multiple tools you might be considering for using imagery, whether it's assisted or not. Um, the role of admin records, there might be different ways of modeling that are, is there, is, is there a design in place yet that's kind of laid out what you're hoping to do with that? Or will there be? There will be. Okay. Um, at this point, I, I think the correct answer is we're working on it. Okay. Um, so I would anticipate coming back in the future and addressing exactly what those different pieces, parts are that are going to, to answer that question. Excellent. Thank you. I have a few clarifiers. Dan Cork, National Academies. Um, actually, I want to start off with a, a comment or a plug, actually, I guess, uh, Evan. In your talk, you started off with a diagram, which nicely laid out pieces of the address canvassing concept, the, four, you know, the two by two split. And the comment was just, I um, consider rotating everything either one tick clockwise or preferably one tick counterclockwise, just so that horizontally across you've got the two in-house, uh, in-office versus in-field canvassing aligned horizontally next to each other over the base of the more conceptual questions. How good is the frame to start off with and how do you approach canvassing? Just a, just a presentation thing. Uh, on the 2015 test for Marianne, um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things that I um, might have misheard. Um, the sentence which you used to describe why Chandler and Mesa were chosen as um, the additional cities within Maricopa. Um, it was based on, I, I thought you said based on higher response rates and lower mobility. And it seemed like it was, uh, yeah. It, it, I don't want to sound pejorative, is it gaming the system or whatnot to try to get the favorable cases or trying to set up a contrast with the outlying areas or with um, central Maricopa? The latter, yeah. Um, you also mentioned doing a power analysis on the cases per hour. And I just, there was a 
combination of a one, a point, and a two, and I don't know what order. <laughs> I can, I, 0 0.12. 0 0.12. That's, we'd like okay. to be able to, to detect statistical differences of 0 0.12 cases per hour. Okay, so that precise as opposed to a whole I'm gonna, case. I'm going to wait and look at Tom and make sure I said that correctly. <laughs> That's what I thought I heard. I just wanted to make sure. Um, you had also mentioned that the in the control panel, the notice of visit that the enumerator would leave would be asking um, the person to call the enumerator back. So presumably they'd have to be writing in um, the cell number or something like that. Is there a concept of having them um, use the same device that they're um, doing the enumeration on? Um, all through one number. I'm just curious whether the, you, you're trying to make the control panel as either 2010-ish or as 2014-ish as possible. Mm -hmm. But the change back to uh, providing, asking them to call the enumerator as opposed to referring them to the website or to the TQA just seemed a little bit odd. I th I'm going to look to someone again, but I thought the, the notice of visit in the control panel for the 2014 test was similar to the con notice of visit for the control panel in the 2015 test. But one thing, it did have the, like the self-response option, and with, since the 2010, in the 2015 test, being able to implement in the control panel as 2010-like as possible, wanted to not have those people having that, that option for, for, for the control panel to do the co appropriate cost comparisons. Okay, so the 2014 test also had a control panel where the notice of visit had them call the enumerator? Okay. Um, just a minor trivia question or whatnot. Is the inbound call function of the phone that you're using Compass on disabled when you're conducting an interview? I'm not sure we know the answer to I, I, that question I'm now, not, but we can find out. Yeah. So the question I'm just curious, is. I mean, following enumerators around during the uh -huh. 2010 census or whatnot, I mm -hmm. had, you know, observed an enumerator mm -hmm. getting the call back from someone. Mm -hmm you know, on their cell phone minutes after they had just left the door. So I'm just, I, you know, there at that point it wasn't keyed to having to conduct an interview on the same device on which I'm supposed to be talking into. I see. Um, not a concern that they may receive a call when they're conducting a different interview. That, no, that, um, I, I was actually more concerned about them conducting inbound call when they're conducting any interview, but particularly I was thinking of the different interview mm -hmm, as opposed mm -hmm. to uh -huh. no, that's just a good suddenly point. getting motivated to call in. Right, um, right. That's a good point. That's just the lightning striking point. But I, I was thinking more concerned of someone who just left the notice of visit getting an immediate call back mm -hmm. at the same time they're trying to do resolve right. a case, right. a, different, a different case. Yeah, so we should look into that. Thank you, Dan. And then one final just clarifying point for Stephen. Um, you said something about zip code being the most precise level at which you could target or I can't remember the exact phrasing but um, make use of existing digital media databases or target digital interventions. It just struck me as interesting that the zip code being tied to delivery of physical mail um, still being the more precise way of targeting digital interventions. Is that just an artifact of the direct mail days or? So uh, digital can be targeted down to a, a much lower level than zip code. The, the construct of the research panels and packaging them by zip codes allowed for a very condensed group and a nice cutoff so that you wouldn't have the bleed over between the various panels. So we could define zip codes. So we would just take it at that higher level. You can go down to a lower level, but for the purpose of the actual test, we would look at zip code first and then mine down into it and look for opportunities within those markets. But you are correct. It definitely goes down. It's not a construct of the postal as much as just a clean cut for the, the geographies of the 20 counties. Thank you. I'm going to ask that we hold further questions, uh, ask them offline or send them to the email so we can stay on schedule today. Uh, before we take a break, uh, Lisa asked me to apologize to you. She 
had hit the wall. Uh, she was definitely a trooper to come in after being sick, uh, so sick this week. Um, I think you'll agree that even while sick, her energy and her enthusiasm tends to be contagious, so I'm glad that we had her while we did. Uh, with that said, let's take a 15-minute break. Let's come back at 3.45. I'm going to suggest that we leave the doors open when we come back and let the air circulate a little bit. I will breeze through the 2016 uh, testing scope, I promise, and, and we'll try to keep it short. Thank you.